thank you for that uh, kind introduction. It's uh, let me make sure I've got the right presentation here. Um, is this me? No, I don't think it is. Uh, That's cool. This this one here, great. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I, it's indeed a pleasure to be here. Uh, some of you might know my my research is uh, tends to focus on how we design cities and uh, try to reduce the energy carbon footprint of the transport sector. So I'm delighted this is being held at a building right next to your train station. I tend to write a lot about what's called transit-oriented development. Um, I have to confess, though, I I've, uh, always am so delighted to come to the Netherlands. I've been invited here on a number of occasions, but I'm, I, I always feel a bit odd being an American coming to the Netherlands talking about this issue. Because you, you know, you've got the most walking friendly, bike friendly cities in the world. You've got great public transport. I come from a land where we drive any and everywhere. So you know, who am I to come here and talk about these issues? So anyway, I, I'm always a little intimidated uh, to speak before a Dutch audience. But that said, it, it's, it's indeed a, a delight to be here. Um, you know, what I thought I, I could talk about <clears throat> this evening uh, is uh, sort of a body of work I've been involved in in, in the last three or four years. And, and I think what has prompted it more than anything, I've been working a lot in rapidly developing cities of the world, rapidly industrializing, modernizing, motorizing cities like ch in Chinese cities, Indian cities. And you know, I, I really sort of preach this gospel we need to create <laughs> cities like the Netherlands, very walkable, bikeable, dense, compact, mixed use, all of these built environment attributes. Uh, to, to reduce the carbon footprint, to really reduce energy consumption, reduce sprawl. And uh, I, I always get this sort of reaction that, well, that's great, but there's an economic cost to that. There's a perception that if you create these kinds of cities, uh, the cost of designing the city, building metro systems, um, giving up some of the private freedom of, of market location choices are going to have some kind of economic consequences. And I, I've tried to accordingly make the case that environmental friendly cities can also be economically very prosperous. So I'm really going to, and I do that mainly because I find when I talk about environmental themes, they only resonate to political leaders if you can show that there's some real significant economic benefits in doing that. So I, I'm going to try to weave this nexus between what I'm calling sustainable mobility, <clears throat> you know, basically traveling by virtually any mode other than the private drive alone automobile, uh, placemaking, because when we travel, we're going to places. We're not traveling for the sake of being in cars or trains. It's really those destinations that matter to us, places. And that if you design places well uh, and promote sustainable mobility, uh, it makes you globally competitive in the economic marketplace. So how do we strike a balance? So um, the first part of my presentation, I have to admit, most of my work in this has been kind of unabashedly <laughs> quantitative, you know, a lot of heavy hitting statistics. And I find, you know, it's good to have empiricism. Um, people want to see numbers and a little good science to back up your claims. But when I, I do that kind of research, I always have a feel that I'm maybe 40 people worldwide are reading this stuff. Because, you know, it's a lot of math and statistical outputs and tables. And who really wants to read that stuff? So I, so, you know, I do a certain amount of that. And I'm going to present that. But I'm also going to present some of the more case-based qualitative work. Because I find when I dig up cases and examples, that's what resonates to political leaders. You know, politicians live in a world of anecdotes. They want to really look at case examples. They don't want to look at regression outputs and so forth. So anyway, I'm going to end more on the qualitative aspect of this topic. Um, well, so let, let me just start off at the outset, a, a kind of a broader framework here. Um, in the transport sector, at least, we know that uh, transport, you know, be it trains, highways, bikeways, whatever, is an important factor to economic productivity. You know, there's a very long established literature going back to an Weberian industrial location theory that argues transport is a factor input to economic production. We have to move labor. <laughs> You know, raw goods and materials, finished products and outputs, ideas, whatever the case might be. But any kind of economic activity and transaction at some point involves movement. Uh, so of course, um, we have a long literature showing that con avoiding congestion, many firms try to sort out and be in locations where they reduce their input transport costs and, and what we call the deadweight losses that are associated with congestion. Now. 
Um, we have a fair amount of literature on this showing that uh, all things been equal, uh, being stuck in traffic, lost time of labor inputs, you know, moving goods and materials, finished products, uh, is an economic cost. And uh, you know, the literature is not as firm in this as you would expect, but the gross regional and domestic product, basically the economic productivity and output, on the range of three to six percent, it varies quite a bit due to time losses, but even things like unpredictability. As we increasingly go to um, just-in-time manufacturing, industrial production, we're very time sensitive. The ability to bring in uh, product components from multiple locations in the world, assemble products and get them out and reduce inventory and labor costs is a way firms like Apple Computer and other major uh, global economic powerhouses increasingly depend on it. And the unpredictable nature of traffic congestion itself carries tremendous economic uh, deadweight losses. <clears throat> now, if you add the externalities of trucks and cars and so forth sitting in traffic, uh, local and global pollution. So, you know, local pollution is a smog in the air. But global pollution is, is something we're all increasingly concerned about, greenhouse gas emissions, something we all globally suffer the consequences of, as well as you know, wasted energy and fuel and accidents. You know, some of these studies show uh, the economic burden is, is anywhere from uh, 6 to 13% of, of gross domestic products of a lot of places. So suffice to say, the literature and, and logic and common sense tells us uh, we need to have as fish efficient movement as possible in our cities. So that has led historically to you know, what I'm just calling the mobility case, that if you invest in transport, motorways, uh, rail systems, and so forth, you're going to enhance access. Access of labor to jobs, access of firms to customers, ac access of suppliers to producers. And that accordingly brings economic uh, benefit of some kind. I mean, that's a fairly simple standard logic. And um, <clears throat> it, this is from the UITP database, which is a database of some 60 global cities, uh, one of the more recent uh, cross-sectional databases I could find. But if you just do some simple plots here, uh, the horizontal axis uh, show transport expenditures. The left is on roads. The right is on public transport per capita, so this is per person in the metro area, and gross domestic product, economic output per capita. And you can see not a necessarily a strong correlation, and of course these are simple regressions, but it's upward sloping nonetheless. And uh, you know, it seems to be there is some association certainly there. <clears throat> now, the question always is though, is uh, from those of us who study these issues, is transportation investment the trigger? Is that really the catalyst that's leading to this? Or is it economic growth and productivity and, and the demands for travel which is inducing investment in transportation? That is, is the causality in the other direction? That is, where you have economic growth is where you're investing in transport infrastructure. And there, there actually has been a lot of what we call these Granger causality tests that have tried to use lag relationships and study these things. And I'll say the literature is pretty in inconclusive. It probably shows more supply side investments leads to economic growth, but you can also show it works in both directions. So it's kind of what we would say a pretty complex endogenous set of relationships. But nonetheless, they're certainly codependent. Um, regardless of what theory and empirical literature might say, <clears throat> if you talk to political leaders, they will tell you this is extremely important. This is um, Siemens. Uh, they put out a Globe Scan report, and this is one came out a few years back. But when they interviewed uh, several hundred mayors of global cities <clears throat> and their chief staff, uh, they asked, what are the priority investments to attract businesses, to make your city region economically competitive. And transportation came up number one. Uh, education was second. You can see down the list, health care and social services towards the bottom. But there is a broad perception that transport is absolutely essential. You know, we, we even hear it now, certainly in the United States, I heard it on the news last night, BBC, Cameron was <laughs> building roads as the way to stimulate the economy. So I think it's, it's a fairly deeply rooted perception. Now, one of the issues here, of course, is what the literature and the empirical evidence doesn't quite tell us as well as is, in, you know, we know and some of our few studies tell us is when you do, you know, let's face it, in most advanced modern economies we're investing in roads, sometimes quite indiscriminately. This happens to be an image of uh, a, a, a typical American freeway, you know, eight to 12 lanes. Uh, and that 
over time, um, this investment, what it obviously does is attract growth out, decentralized, spread out, car-oriented growth. Uh, and people start switching modes uh, from public transport to driving. They change routes. They make longer trips. And quickly, because of those structural adjustments, uh, firms and activities attracted to these corridors and people making behavioral adjustments in mode of travel, distance, and time, and so forth. Quickly, that added capacity gets eaten up. It gets consumed, and you're back to square one. So um, it, you only provide ephemeral relief if you simply rely on kind of hardware supply side investments. And I think this has led to increasingly acknowledgement you can't build yourself out of traffic congestion. You've got to manage it through things like congestion pricing and demand parking restraints and enhancing options, including public transit, you know, bus rapid transit, and so forth. So anyway, uh, it's, it's short term, we know that, and it's insufficient in and of itself that sort of just respond by building roads. Now, <clears throat> there's of course spatial implications. Um, you know, what urban transport economists will say is that when you invest in transport infrastructure like this, you, you enlarge trade sheds, labor sheds, market sheds. And you know, in many ways that's a good thing because what it means is firms can better Re uh, recruit and attain high-skilled labor suited to particular positions. They have a larger market, a pool of potential labor to draw upon, so they can better match the job to the available uh, labor market, and, and vice versa. Workers can find the kind of job best suited to their skill sets, their career aspirations, and so forth. So in theory, you get better matching if you enlarge labor sheds. At least that's what the theory tells us. The problem we have, though, is when this is all largely market-driven and it's done in an environment of fairly minimal planning, uh, does enlargement basically translate to sprawl? Does that really lead to very high fiscal costs, environmental costs, and so forth? So there might be a private sector benefit, but are, are there huge unaccounted for uh, social environmental costs that go with it? And you know, I, I think we know that decentralization is part of modernization, but uh, I think it really comes down to quite essentially how that enlargement, sprawl, or decentralization, what you want to call it, is managed and organized. And I, you know, just from one of my books where I compared a city like Curitiba, Brazil, uh, three and a half million inhabitants in Brazil, it's uh, actually an industrial city, it's the largest industrial city in Brazil, but it's a well planned city. And you can see these bus rapid transit corridors. It's got density, but it's a very linearly defined density. Um, versus a city like Sao Paulo, admittedly a much larger city, but, um, and I actually um, have those numbers switched around. Sao Paulo is a city of six million, um, uh, Curitiba is uh, three or so million. But Sao Paulo is largely a very piecemeal, ad hoc, unplanned city, just scattershot development in all directions. And you can see Curitiba, uh, actually, I've got the numbers absolutely flipped around. So <laughs> just switch that table around. Acts, adds, uh, averages more public transport trips per person per year. But importantly, uh, some rural bank numbers that compare these cities has lower traffic congestion costs, less time lost in traffic per person per year, in large part because it's got dedicated swift bus lanes and it's well planned. Uh, it's a smaller city, maybe that accounts for it partly, but the simple point I'm making here is planning matters. That, you know, if you do get enlargement and decentralization, all of the evidence tells us physical planning can make a difference. And you, you can look at other evidence on this. I mean, take amongst the best planned European cities, from, certainly from a public transport standpoint, uh, Zurich and, and Munich. Um, fairly prosperous cities, their GDP per person in US dollars is over 40,000, 45,000 in that range. On a parity purchasing power basis, if you match that to a city of Chicago, fairly comparable income, but hardly, you know, by American standards, a fairly transit friendly city. But it's, it's public transport trips per person per year is just a fraction of these smaller European cities. But importantly, the vehicle kilometers traveled. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, this literature I have refers to both kilometers and miles. And my apologies here. Some of the stuff I'm going to be talking about in miles, some in kilometers. I assume everyone makes the uh, conversion. It's uh, one mile is uh, 1.61 kilometers. So anyway, it's in VKT. But w the reason we look at vehicle kilometers traveled, that's the number of kilometers in motor motorized vehicles per person per year, 
Uh, there's not a better overarching metric we, we can find in the transport sector to gauge sustainability. As VKT per person per year goes up, so does energy consumption, so does um, tailpipe emissions, both local pollution, global uh, carbon emissions, so does land consumption. So if there's anything we want to be tracking to show that a benchmarking to show that we're indeed creating more sustainable cities from a transport sector perspective, it's VKT. That's something we want to reduce. So, you know, we can see in this case, you can have very prosperous cities and fairly low travel levels and successful public transit. So it's not necessarily it has to be an auto-oriented city, just some simple case comparisons. Um, we're in the United States embroiled in a debate right now on this core kind of central issue between those who are saying build more roads uh, and let the travel flow uh, because that's an ingredient to economic prosperity. And this just simply is tracking from 1950 to roughly 2010 uh, across the United States, indexed to 1990 numbers. <coughs> um, the change in vehicle miles, so I'm in miles instead of kilometers here, but the miles traveled in vehicles um, versus GDP. And you can see they corresponded pretty closely up to 2000. And um, so, so a lot of people looked at those statistics historically and said, well, you know, even though we're sprawling and we're um, building roads, uh, our economy is tracking that. So this formula must be an you know, ingredient towards success. But you notice since 2000, uh, we've actually managed to uh, taper off the rate of travel and it's, it's increased at a much slower rate than GDP. In fact, um, in the 50 largest American cities, uh, we've actually had a decline in vehicle miles traveled per person of roughly five to six percent. Now, some of that's due to the recession and the economy. But the biggest decline actually has been in folks many of your age, the millennials, uh, basically 20 to 32 years of age. Some of it, again, the economy, they're, they're some are unemployed, so they're traveling less, but some of it's social media and networking, uh, Google Transit, car sharing, and lifestyle choices. Increasingly, people want to be in a less car-dependent lifestyle for social re for environmental, ethical reasons, or whatever the case might be. So there's a host of things. But why this has become important is because um, the way we choose to finance our infrastructure is uh, our transport infrastructure is we have fuel taxes. And um, we, we tax the, uh, you know, so many pennies per gallon of, ta of uh, gas you consume. So it's a consumption-based tax. But as our vehicle fleet becomes more energy efficient and we get more electric cars and hybrids, we're generating less revenue from <coughs> traditional fuel taxes. So they're saying, well, let's use GPS systems to monitor VMT as a way to um, generate revenue. Well, the, you know, the Reason Foundation and, and a lot of libertarians and Tea Party types and so forth are saying, well, wait a second, uh, if you're going to monitor VMT and tax it, uh, you're going to suppress economic growth. Well, so, and they cite these statistics, but we can now say since 2000, there's something different going on here, and, so, and perhaps it's not that direct correspondence. So this Center for Clean Air Policy that produced this uh, graph when it tracks state level GDP versus vehicle miles traveled, you can see it's a negative relationship. So you have states like New York, uh, which has um, the lowest vehicle miles traveled, obviously dominated by New York City, where a good share of the population uses public transport and walks and bikes. Not unlike what you have in your cities here, but it's quite unusual in the United States. We have that kind of behavior. Um, and it's got high GDP uh, versus, I don't know, states like Mississippi, uh, and a lot of travel going on in relatively low incomes. So they look at, the, they cite this saying, well, this is further proof. Uh, the, the problem is, though, when you think about management of, of cities and, and how you reduce vehicle miles traveled, um, and trying to reduce sprawl and create transit-friendly environments, what we generally call smart growth, it doesn't occur at the state level. This is what one would argue is a classical ecological fallacy, using very aggregate scale data to draw inferences of something which is, should be a city-level phenomenon. We're managing urban growth. When you break these statistics down to the metro level, there's no relationship going on. So, you know, the, um, the literature and the empirical evidence, suffice to say, is very conflicted on this. We get all kinds of mixed signals, and accordingly, it makes it hard to inform public policy. 
Um, just a little bit more to, to framing the issue here, uh, again, partly from a U.S. perspective, and I'm going to have to get moving here because of time. Uh, th these are further statistics showing projections of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, if we, um, it, historical data as well as projections to 2030. And, and it's based on the assumption if we have more fuel efficient vehicle fleets, that's the green line, and we have um, lower carbon fuel supplies, you know, biofuels and uh, ele electric plug-in hybrids and alternative fuel sources, we can drive down CO2 emissions uh, even in the United States, quite a bit lower than historical numbers, just simply through technology. But the problem with that techn technological solution to this problem is it's ignoring the fact that we've had increasing uh, tra sprawl and travel, at least historically. And if you account for that, um, let me just go back down again. Sorry. If you, um, okay, I'm, I'm going the wrong direction here. Uh, I thought I knew, knew which way to, okay, I'm, I'm going totally, okay, sorry. So if you count for the fact, again, uh, we can drive it down, but if you show the growth in vehicle kilometers traveled, if you extrapolate that out, what we've been trending towards, all of the gains we've made through technology are offset, and CO2 levels go back to historical heights. So this has led, I think, to a, an acceptance of the fact that we, we, you know, we have to advance sustainable technologies, you know, fuel efficient vehicles, uh, low carbon fuel supplies, but also what I call sustainable urbanism, things that are going to reduce vehicle kilometers traveled. We've done a lot of studies on this. Um, I have in many other U.S. Uh, transportation academics and quite a few Europeans and Dutch scholars as well, and I think the literature is fairly um, consistent on this. This happens to be a study we did in San Francisco showing that the compact uh, you know, dense mixed-use pedestrian-friendly places average 30 to 40 percent less VKT and CO2 emissions in more sprawled locations. And talking about, if you're familiar with the Bay Area, the most urban districts like San Francisco, Berkeley, and Oakland, <coughs> um, very substantially smaller. So, you know, this more or less leads to this notion then that we should be promoting density, mixed-use, kind of a physical design to uh, reduce travel. And what are the wealth implications of that? Well, when we talk about density, we're, we're obviously talking about spatial clustering and, and the knowledge spillovers that go from having well-trained, high-skilled, specialized labor physically congregated near each other. So access to specialized skills, ease of external transaction, just the discovery and innovation that comes from having smart folks clustered together. I mean, that's pretty much what the theory of the Silicon Valley has been. Um, and, you know, you see these elasticities, the doubling of density, all things considered, in this range of 5 to 8% bump in economic output, that clearly only applies to service knowledge-based economies, uh, not to all economic um, situations. <clears throat> this happens to be a study I published um, a little while back now in Urban Studies that tried to track this for the San Francisco Bay Area where, um, you know, looking at historical data showed that labor access, uh, if you doubled it, these are elasticities, all things being equal, you got a 10% increase in economic productivity. But employment density, which is sort of the spatial clustering, the agglomeration factor, uh, there was a 7% rise, but speed, actually building infrastructure to increase speed also led to productivity. So, you know, it, it, it Kind of what this article argue, and I think it's consistent with what most people believe now, is that we have to make progress on both fronts. We have to create compact, as, uh, accessible locations. That is, agglomeration creates economic benefits, as does access to supply side investment. It's not either or. Well, you know, the model that many folks have seized upon to begin to create this agglomeration form with hopefully positive economic outcomes is, is what generally has been referred to as transit-oriented development, TOD. Perhaps one of the uh, prototypes is Vallingby in Stockholm. Um, I, I wrote a book a, a few years back now called The Trans Metropolis, and this was a big case I used, and I had not been there in some 15 years, and I actually was in Stockholm um, last month, and I got to visit this place again, and it, you know, it really is truly a well-designed place. It's, it's got all of those, and this was designed back in the late 50s, early 60s, but um, not a very uh, necessarily sweeping, really radical idea, just simply creating compact mixed-use activities uh, near the train stations surrounded by green belts of well-defined well buffer zones, so kind of Ebenezer Howard's Garden Cities of Tomorrow. 
But there was certainly, and there continues to be a, a strong emphasis on what we call placemaking, creating a hub, a community center, a place where um, you know, functionally, people congregate there to basically access the train stations, but an idea that it's more than a place just to pass through. It's also a place to be. So uh, sort of a modern day agora, if you will. Those are some of the attributes we as uh, associate with placemaking. You know, it's comfortable, it's memorable. Uh, it's, it's, it's a place where you would go for farmer's markets, open air concerts public celebrations, public demonstrations, it's symbolically and functionally the hub, the heart of the community. Uh, hopefully it allows for social engagement and social diversity. Uh, it's not just a place to hop on trains. The, the problem though we have is that um, <clears throat> there's a conflict between many times a place a, a, as a, a, an activity you socially engage and uh, it's a community center. Uh, versus a node, which is a kind of a logistical point where you have many times conflicting activities. It's an interchange point for car parking, bus drop-off, taxis, pedestrians, delivery trucks. Uh, and you do create these conflict points. And, and many times when we design a station area from a nodal perspective, it becomes an engineering feat. It, it has the attributes of an engineered location, not necessarily this comfortable, memorable place you want. It perhaps would be more of an architect's uh, take on, on the environment. And, and what I have found in my research that successful transit-oriented developments really distinguish themselves. Either they are predominantly places and they make these confluent logistical activities very secondary or somewhat peripheral to the design, or else they ignore this fact of being a community hub and they simply become logistical places. They, they do one or the other. It, many times it's schizophrenic to try to achieve both. Um, I and my students have been working on this community in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is called Fruitvale. It, it's a, a Latino neighborhood. It's south of Oakland. And it's a place that we have struggled with for years. It's had gang problems. It's drug problems. but. There, there, there was a sense that it had a historical heart and, and kind of a, a heritage to it that needed to be embraced, that there was a lot of opportunity. You had some merchants and working class individuals and families that really wanted to see this place enhanced. And we helped them a lot trying to sort through this place versus node identity. And through a series of charrettes, um, we, my students and I sort of came up with some design ideas uh, to, to really begin to create this Latino themed place. And these are just some images. Um, ground floor retail, you know, by European standards, these aren't very dense, but by American standards outside of the CBD, Central Business District, uh, they're considered to be transit oriented. Second level housing and loft space. Um, but when you get to the main street, this is what you hit, a pretty lousy urban environment. And using things like Photoshop, these are things my students do, you um, just come up with images of how this might be transformed over time. Green always helps in terms of creating these images. But, but the notion is that, um, you know, this, this is not how this place will be. We, we do these charrettes basically to engage local citizens to really have honest, heartfelt discussions of possible urban transformations that could be, occur. You know, it, it's, we, we as urban planners tend to show future places from what we call plan view. It's like you're a bird flying over a community and just looking down. But most people don't experience a community like that. They experience it at street level. So it's only when you start showing these kinds of transformations, we find you can really engage the citizens and really have better d discussions and dialogue. Now, you can do all the great uh, place making but unless this is kind of a nice network uh, on a regional scale, all of the evidence tells that it doesn't work. Okay, well, what does this all mean for <laughs> regional productivity? I told you I was going to hit a little statistical analysis, but I'll make this kind of quick. Um, we just, uh, one of my PhD students and I have just done some analysis where we've tried to associate on the left-hand side GMP, gross metropolitan product, you know, uh, at the metro level, an economic uh, productivity indicator with a series of variables over time, uh, and we had 27 U.S. metro areas from 1998 to 2009 with some time lag structure. It was a randomness effect model with some fixed effect um, factors to account for unique attributes of cities. Uh, but we, we basically had a series of business agglomeration indicators and rail network indicators as a way to get at rail-based access, connectivity. And without um, going through um, 
the mathematics too much of this analysis. Just to show you kind of how this worked, one of our more successful cases in the United States, some of you might be familiar with, is, is Portland. Uh, probably comes as close to European style urbanism in terms of creating these walkable, bikeable districts around, in this case, the light rail network. Now, partly what makes Portland work is its 2040 plan, which they passed in 1990, but they created an urban growth boundary, which basically capped how much they could sprawl. Uh, with a fairly vast forest, I mean, you can see the lower piece there, where the concept is you can't keep on growing outward. You've got to grow inward and upward, and they put in place all the policy instruments and tools to shape that growth along transit corridors. And, you know, the, there's some blemishes here, but on balance, they have managed to attract some of the growth to um, these transit centers. Well, in this model, what we were trying to measure were changes in agglomeration. In the case of Portland, you did get spatial clustering over time, this, this uh, 11 or 12 year time series, but it was in the form of multiple centers, what we would call polycentric growth, where actually the central business district, its role in knowledge base um, industries. Uh, Portland is, is the home, for instance, of Intel. They have a major manufacturing plant, um, Microsoft, a lot of high-tech firms on what's called the Silicon Force, which, which is on the left or the western side here. This shows employment agglomerations in 1998. These are a series of indicators. Um, what's called the Nike 50 code is, is a whole slew of kind of high-tech knowledge base industries. And more or less what this graph shows is you got more multi-centered uh, development, less of a dominant CBD, and, and a fair amount of spatial clustering based on what we call the Moran's uh, I index. So if you look on the left-hand side, it, it doesn't show up that greatly, but you can see the downtown's getting smaller and the, the western side is getting higher densities and more agglomerations. So this happens to be, in a, again, a case where um, you've got basically from more of a monocentric uh, to a polycentric clustering, particularly of knowledge-based high-skilled labor. In terms of the network changes, again, a series of connectivity indicators which are, reflect accessibility, but as the original line um, got extended to the airport and you had a, a tramway, what we call streetcar circulator, and you got future extensions, um, Basically, the network allowed greater access, had more complexity, uh, vastly enhanced transit access. So we did this time series analysis across 27 U.S. metro areas, and more or less, this finding um, showed that, you know, as we hoped and expected, that density mattered you, uh, as population density increased, but importantly, as spatial clustering based on this Moran's eye and what we call the, the effective density of um, these knowledge-based industries increased, uh, you got higher economic output. We also showed connecting transit lines to an airport drew up the economic productivity, particularly for cities part of the, of the global economy as we defined it in this Pi index of connectivity. So basically building your transit network, creating spatial clusters, particularly in knowledge-based industries, we were able to show over this time series using this um, model structure, in the US at least, there was some significant relationships going on. Uh, just applying this model to some scenarios or, or actual data, this happens to be Los Angeles where they embarked on a major urban regeneration project on Bunker Hill um, along with some expansion of transit improvements. But if you look at the changes in uh, knowledge-based workers concentrated in this district, a 23% increase, and when we put this into our model, it estimated uh, the GNP per worker went up 1.2%. Um, the case of San Francisco, where we extended the BART line to the airport, you know, putting that into the model, it was a 6.3% increase. So anyway, uh, some empirical evidence, at least, trying to show agglomeration, uh, particularly for our, uh, business knowledge-based sectors uh, had some, some positive impact. We've now extended this kind of analysis to high-speed rail because in the United States we're very much trying to mimic what you do in Europe. Uh, and you know, if you look at the literature on this, it shows most fast train services in terms of its role in economic development. It's largely redistributive. It tends to strengthen the poles, the major urban centers, whatever uh, major clustering agglomeration effects you might get tend to be very highly localized and limited to a handful of, of uh, station areas. 
And again, what has triggered this analysis is we're trying to do this throughout the US, build these fast train systems in California. Uh, we have a proposal connecting Los Angeles, San Diego to the Bay Area, San Francisco, but at a huge cost. I mean, the last figures I showed, I've seen were up, up somewhere to around 90 to $100 billion. I mean, where we would ever get that money, one never knows. But the only way to get politicians uh, to, to seriously think about this is not only investment of moving people quickly between cities, but actually to shape the growth and have, hopefully get some economic uh, gains, benefits, just to show that if you can create those knowledge-based industries and activities around train stations, you hopefully create economic benefits that over time can offset those costs. So, you know, we, we've, at, at my research center, have been trying to study some of these relationships. And, you know, if you look at London, for instance, there is a bit of evidence showing um, these relationships of where you've had changes in employment density, uh, high-speed terminuses or train terminuses throughout the UK. Uh, you've had higher economic earnings. It's particularly been the case in inner uh, London. Probably the best evidence of this is the Shinkansen network uh, in Japan, uh, where you have over 40 or 45 years of experience between Tokyo and Osaka with high-speed train services. Um, you can see, for, and this is an analysis we recently did, uh, you can see that for the Osaka trip, which is um, two, point, uh, two and a half hours by train, uh, that seems to be the threshold where the train outcompetes the airplane. 89% of the market travels by train over that distance. Over much longer distances, such as uh, 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 Hiroshima, uh, the, uh, the airplane is, is, is you know, where it's almost four hours ha has the edge. So it's really those kind of two to three hour travel markets that, uh, which, which would mimic LA to San Francisco that we think there's benefits. But again, we can only begin to budge interest in this if we can show economic productivity gains. Well, we did a bit of analysis of this around uh, some of the train stations on the um, uh, Shinkansen line uh, in, in Japan, and these are basically five kilometer analysis breaking down by analysis zones using a technique called cluster analysis. Because of time, I won't go through the details other than to say we use what are called location quotients where we looked at concentrations around the, those five kilometer buffer train stations vis-a-vis -vis regional averages. So which were the areas that had particularly knowledge business sector activities and um, if you, in using cluster analysis, we came up with eight a typology of eight types of Takedo Shinkansen train stations. Um, the, these are 2006 data. But the ones that really have the kind of knowledge-based industries that would benefit from agglomeration or spatial clustering, uh, Tokyo Station, the Shingawa Station, Nagoya, and Osaka, the major urban centers, those are the ones based on annual GDP growth over this time series uh, had the highest numbers. And, and we tried to use these kind of numbers to argue LA and San Francisco being part of the global economy, if we could achieve that degree of clustering, uh, we think there's this sort of economic payoff. Well, it's not only through uh, this kind of econometric analysis, but even land markets should absorb this. If there is spatial clustering and there's economic benefits, there's a finite limited supply of real estate. Those who own that land should be able to charge higher rents or leases. The market will bid up the privilege to be located in those concentrated areas. And you know, we're, we're able to show this at some of these major urban centers off these high speed stations in Shinkansen, a fairly substantial real estate gain at a time when most of Japan's real estate market has been in decline. It, it actually has had a very difficult real estate situation since uh, the 1990s. In fact, the only locations where commercial land values uh, along these stations have increased have been these big urban centers where you have knowledge, high school labor concentrated, labor which is part of the global economy. So we, you know, even though we have no empirical evidence in the US except for the Northeast corridor to begin to sort these relationships, you know, we think this kind of experience in Japan and the, uh, what other evidence we can dig up begins to make a case for, an economic case if you will, for concentration. Um, just to sort of make a link here is um, I think as you have here in Europe that these high-speed Shinkansen to Kaido line trains, uh, they have different services. Uh, the limited stop service between Tokyo and Osaka, where it only stops at three or four stations, is something they've increased over time. 
what, what I would call a virtuous circle in the sense that the economic growth in these urban centers creates more of a market demand for those train station destinations, which has led to a differentiation of service policy. So this just simply shows this uh, Nozimo, which is a limited six-stop service between Tokyo and Osaka, has actually had uh, the biggest gains in ridership. So they're basically feeding off each other. Wherever you have the most growth, the, the highest market demand to be, has led to these service reforms, which has led to ridership increases, which has led to even greater demand to concentrate in those uh, locations. So kind of this virtuous cycle pattern. So anyway, um, that's my statistical evidence, if you will, uh, based on some recent work that you know, largely focused on what we've been trying to inform in the United States looking at some of these global experiences. Well, as I told you, um, I find when I do this research and present it and publish it, I, I've got a feeling there's only a limited set of people I even hear from that seems to read this stuff. Um, when I uh, focus on cases, um, again, uh, it seems to resonate more. So I, I, I've tried to, in terms of my approach to research, increasingly do this mixed method model where I, I rely on empiricism and a good uh, quantitative information to hopefully establish some compelling logic and or, you know some evidence that something's going on here, but uh, it's the cases that sort of t tell you more why and how. You know the, the um, quantitative stuff will kind of say how much and what, but many politicians want to know more uh, the the political dynamics and institutional factors that are under play. So it's uh, th those are kinds of things that I use to try to balance this out. So just a little bit of snippet of some case-based work that I think reinforces these arguments. Uh, again, focused on kind of these knowledge-based professional class workers, what Richard F Florida famously referred to as a creative class. You know, increasingly uh, critical to economic competitiveness in the global economy. Um, livability, place-making matters. Um, and some of these places have embraced this idea, if you want these creative class workers, you really emphasize art, culture, entertainment, what's been called the ACE model of economic development. Now, um, we've done some analysis on this in the United States where we've looked at these developments around transit stations, TOD. This happens to be a plot of distance from the station and the percent increase in land value. And it shows the differentials between those station areas where there's a very strong emphasis on quality of pedestrian environment, good urbanism, good aesthetics, good design, and where there's less of an emphasis on um, good pedestrian environments, good urbanism. And you can see the differentials. I mean, this is sort of an order of magnitude uh, meta-analysis summary, but some evidence even in the United States that there's a premium of placemaking. I think that, um, more compelling evidence I've seen on this is some work we did. This came out in Urban Studies in Hong Kong. Um, you know, Hong Kong is a little extreme. It, it, you can't necessarily generalize from Hong Kong's experiences to anywhere in the world, but nonetheless, it shows this happens to be a public transit authority, the MTR Corporation, where the majority of their income as a public transit agency is not from public transport fares. In fact, only 28% of their income comes from fares. Uh, 60 plus percent comes from property development. They basically sell the air rights and development rights of property above and next to stations to the private sector. And the way they're able to do this, uh, the Special Administrative Region of Hong Kong um, owns all land. They give 99-year leases. and before they actually um, announce publicly they're going to put a station in the site, uh, they get the development rights from the uh, Special Administrative Region of Hong Kong at the pre-rail price. Uh, they then announce we're going to put a station there. They have an RFP process. They invite private investors to come in, and, and they sell the development rights, 99-year leases, at the post-rail price. And it's that differential. Uh, that drives up the value of land tremendously. They take that profit, invest it in future extensions. And they've been doing this model for about 25 years now, very successfully. Now, one of the reasons this happens is that I think institutionally they have the right model. Um, the, the MTR Corporation, two-thirds of the company is owned by government, the special administrative region. So 
Uh, they have to really protect the public interest because they're representing the public at large. They're the predominant owner of the company. But one third is owned by private individuals. So they have to make a return on investment. They have to pay dividends. So they have to be entrepreneurial. So this kind of institutional model, I think, reflects the quasi-public mixed good characteristics of public transit. It serves both a public interest and a private interest. But it's led to this incredible entrepreneurialism. And you see this at all these stations where you get this shopping mall and high-rise towers with very high premiums right above the stations. Instead of letting a handful of, of private real estate speculators reap all of that value added, the public sector gets the majority of that wealth that's created. Some of it goes to the private sector, but they, they've done this model quite successfully. Now, we, um, we've, we did some analysis of a lot of these stations, and um, we, we did what's called a walkability audit. So you know, in this case, this one station, we, we took seven different walking tours within more or less a five minute walk shed of the station and, and measured it on connectivity, uh, retail pedestrian links, and some of this is somewhat a, a subjective, uh, aesthetics, openness, uh, legibility focus, um, uh, wayfinding, and so forth. And when we looked at some of the early stations where they did this rail plus property program, basically sell off the development rights where all they were cared about was massing buildings on top of stations. This is what the typical pedestrian environment looked like. I mean, it was pretty dreadful. It was what we're calling the, the 1980s, 1990s pre-place making station access. They basically had nothing but a bunch of accountants selling off the development rights, trying to make maximum profits, and not giving any attention to urban design or aesthetics or urbanism outside the station. In 2000, they formed a town planning division uh, where they hired urban designers to not to work with the, you know, real uh, real estate economists and, and accountants. To, to emphasize not only selling development rights and putting out buildings, but also aestheticism and design and circulation and quality of urbanism around the station. So they came up with this TOD concept for their stations and went to each of the stations and came up with the design. And when we, we did those walkability audits, and, and, and these are what some of the access environments look like um, post uh, um, this TOD model. And I'm not necessarily to defend this as urbanism, but in terms of, and, and again, Hong Kong is extreme, but it, it much better urban milieu outside the stations before versus after. And we were able, through a series of quantitative analyses, uh, but some case-based studies as well, show that there was a ridership bonus when they blended good urban design with stacking up buildings around the stations, but they also made more profit. They were actually the per square foot premium they were able to sell off as a result of that was much higher. And we sort of concluded that sustainable urbanism and sustainable finance are really reinforcing. That in this case, they made more money, more economic benefit came out of this than, than uh, not. So, so again, the argument here is that good urbanism is not necessarily unprofitable. If you do it well, you, you make profits on both the public and the private sector. Uh, another kind of case-based analysis that um, sort of has sorted through this uh, relationship between placemaking, mobility, creative class, and so forth, and some work we did a couple years ago now in Seoul, Korea. Um, <clears throat> th this is very much a model of, of what we're calling urban regeneration or land reclamation and building bus wrap and transit systems. Um, much of it uh, due to the credit of Mombuk Lee, who uh, was the former mayor of Seoul and then was president of South Korea, and he was just uh, someone who succeeded him. He's a very interesting character. He was the head of Hyundai Corporation, which was the largest construction company uh, in South Korea for a number of years. And uh, you know, he retired about age 62, and um, they called him Bulldozer Lee. He repeatedly when there was a construction project, one time he, he, was, he wanted to know how things work, so he, he, he disassembled a, uh, a, a, some construction equipment, an earth remover, and reassembled it over three or four days himself. I mean, he really wanted to know that level of detail with his company. So he, he was a renowned character. But what um, 
made him an interesting person is that when he became a politician, his company built freeways all over the country. When he became a politician, he sort of started seeing the consequences of this model uh, of, you know, you can see Seoul in the 1990s where they were building these master plan new towns on the periphery, connecting them by these massive motorways, air pollution awful. Um, he was of the mind that we're not going to be a competitive city with Shanghai and Tokyo and uh, other you know, Asian tigers of, of East Asian economy unless we turn this around. This is not a way to recruit and retain high school labor, to bring in creative class workers, to, uh, to really be an economically competitive city, both because of traffic congestion, but also the poor quality of place, the poor environment. Turns out um, he invited Jaime Lerner from Curitiba to come and sh talk about the Curitiba experience, and then Jaime inverted him to visit Curitiba, and as they say, uh, he found religion. When in, he sort of became mayor, he embarked on this program of land reclamation, basically taking real estate that was given over to the private car and converting it and reclaiming it to real estate for people and activities. And you can see it uh, in the case of the Oval at the um, City Hall in Seoul. But, but the most famous is this Chingi Chinyan freeway where um, they took this elevated freeway right in the heart of Seoul disassembled it and changed it into a greenway, a, a, a greenway corridor. Um, what I find absolutely fascinating about it is they were able to do this in a two-year period. In, in the United States, this would take 25 years just to go through entitlements and, and reviews and all this stuff. Anyway, it's, uh, th there are advantages to autocracies where you can just sort of push things through. Um, but if you go there, it's repeatedly the second most popular tourist destination in all of Seoul. Uh, you know, it's it's a nice spot in you know at night. It's where families gather. Um, you know, it's had certainly uh, social environmental benefits. This shows the Chingi Chinyan corridor. Uh, its thermal intensity, its temperature during the summer months or, or you know during the summer period, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a corridor just a couple of city blocks away. And just that greening has lowered the temperature of that corridor two to five degrees Celsius. So, you know, we're concerned about heat island effects. So it's, it's had broader impact uh, than uh, becoming a popular location for families and so forth. But when we tried to look at the effect of this freeway to greenway conversion, uh, we looked at a couple of things. One was to study the effect on land prices. Uh, again, there's a limited supply of good real estate, and if you do things well, the market will bid up the price. And when we, we ran some hedonic price models, I, I won't go through the quantitative parts of this, but this graph just simply shows, it, it shows the marginal effect of location, uh, of those location distances from either the freeway, which is in red, or the greenway, the Chingi Chinyan corridor, of those distance bands relative to a distance uh, beyond 500 meters. So you can see, you know, it's, it's a, the highest premiums are located to the spine itself, the freeway and the greenway, but there actually were higher uh, land value premiums under the greenway than the freeway. The market, in terms of commercial land prices, and we found very similar, the weaker relationships were residential, had bidded up higher value on the amenity of a greenway than it had on this paved motor, elevated motorway. Um, but perhaps the, the more important thing, uh, apropos our research that we were doing, is, is we looked at effects on creative class employment sectors of the Greenway versus the freeway. And, and this, by the way, is published in, um, in, in Urban Studies of a couple of years ago, this, this analysis. Um, and, and by creative class workers, you know, we, it was a fairly widely defined group. It was um, engineers, architects, we, we actually included lawyers, I think, in the creative class. You know, one could quibble on that. But, you know, bohemians, artists, uh, musicians, it was a fairly wide band of groups. But when we measured location quotients, and again, this tells us what the relative concentration of those employment sectors are in this zone versus the region at large, we found higher location quotient premiums right around the Greenway corridor than there was the Freeway corridor. There was some evidence there was sorting going on and those kinds of firms and employees were, were locating in higher 
uh, place value locations than mobility value locations. <coughs> um, now, this is not to suggest the, the solution to these issues are to take away road space, replace it with bikeways and greenways and, and lovely green space and go home. You've, you've got to do something in return. And it, of course, to their credit, and again, this is borrowing from Curtiba's model, at the same time they were reclaiming land from the motorist and, and the motorways, they were rapidly expanding dedicated busway services, bus rapid transit. They, they have a you know, pretty impressive metro rail system as well. I think in terms of kilometers, it's the second largest metro rail network in the world. It's a massive network. But they also started to reassign road space to high capacity buses. And so you can see some of these before and after images and fairly substantial increase in, in ridership and, and some environmental benefits. So, so again, it's not um, either or. It's not just a matter of placemaking and good urbanism. You still have to have good mobility. And I think their experiences, um, you know, these are very complex relationships, but I, Seoul certainly has, uh, by most indicators, increased its location on, on the global competitive marketplace in, in terms of its relative standing. And I would submit uh, it's a product of this good urban planning, both placemaking as well as good mobility-based planning, in this case, uh, rewarding high-capacity sustainable transport. Um, so, you know, the, what I'm calling freeway deconstruction as a model of urban regeneration, less mobility, I, I, I think is, and we're seeing this um, throughout the United States, and I, I know they're looking at this in other parts of Europe. I was in Stockholm last month and uh, Schlieschen, and they're thinking about taking out some freeways and re returning them to pedestrians. Uh, but, but I think it really does represent this reflection that maybe uh, we've gotten this wrong, that you know, we, we have embarked on the model in the United States, certainly of the last 40 or 50 years of kind of private market-driven urbanism with a lot of sprawl, building motorways which feed the sprawl, and that's become the model, but over time, very high costs, high environmental costs, high energy consumption costs, high social exclusion costs, uh, and high fiscal costs of serving that. But also a sense that over time, that's gonna make a less globally competitive region. You're not gonna be able to recruit and retain high-skilled workers. People don't wanna be in those kind of environments. Firms are gonna suffer a deadweight loss of moving goods and materials stuck in traffic. So. Achieving this balance between maybe less mobility in certain locations, putting a better emphasis on compact mixed-use development, good transit integration, good urbanism, good pedestrian bike infrastructure, seems to be, I think increasingly the evidence is showing, is not a way to promote sustainable urban development, but is also an effective economic development strategy, it is a way uh, hopefully to become globally competitive. So these are just examples of places that have, in America that have taken away these elevated freeways, have returned to surface streets, have created more green, and along with this, in all cases, massively invested in public transport, transit-oriented development, and so, so forth. So it's kind of a, 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 um, a paradigm shift, if you will, in terms of models of urban planning, uh, trying to achieve more of a balance, less of kind of market-driven mobility-based design, and more balancing between supply-side investments and placemaking. So anyway, uh, I'm, I'll close with that observation that um, you know supply side investments, operational improvements, we, we need that. So I'm not up here to stand. We should be making the argument, taking down freeways all over the place and replacing motorways with bikeways and transit. We, we still need supply side investments. But because of factors like induced demands and some of the longer term, or, you know, we've seen it in America over 30 or 40 years, we've tracked auto-dependent suburban sprawl, the very high social environmental fiscal costs that go with that, um, we need a different model. So supply-side investments are essential, particularly if you have more traditional industrial-based economies, less maybe tied to knowledge-based industries in the global marketplace. And we still have a fair amount of industrial cities where probably spatial agglomeration is not the key to e economic expansion. We still need good uh, urban logistics, good infrastructure for moving goods, people, and raw materials. Um, because of induced demand, though, even where you have supply side investments, I think it goes without saying, traffic management is always important. You've got to have the right pricing, road pricing, parking pricing, public transport pricing as an incentive to encourage 
people to use more sustainable modes of mobility uh, without diminishing. And so, you know, all the, I didn't so much get into this topic here, but some of the evidence we've seen where you m combine kind of things like transit-oriented development with road pricing and pricing of parking, you tend to get synergies. You tend to get even more uh, benefits in terms environmental benefits, but potentially even some economic benefits. Um, but you know, I'll just close by saying, you know, this notion of transit orientation, trying to focus more agglomeration and clustering on your privileged transit corridors, uh, particularly for global city regions and some of the major urban centers. You know, some of the suburban centers I've seen even in Dutch cities, uh, in a, like um, Schiphol, and some of those environments where you have kind of knowledge-based industrial plants. But making them less car dependent, l less massive parking lots, and more of a clustering and physical orientation where we know uh, when you do that, you have to combine with creating those good places, you know, memorable, comfortable, human scaled, good wayfinding, good connectivity. Those are all the attributes the evident evidence tells us, and, and I think even just kind of logic and common sense tells us are really essential to making them less car dependent more sustainable in their demise, uh, design. So, so anyway, <clears throat> we're trying to make the case that if you take the collectivity of this evidence, I mean, I, I'm not presenting here a general systems model that shows us. I, what I've really shown is a couple of snapshots, both empirical and some case-based evidence. But I think I would argue uh, what we d can observe is, is placemaking can become a very effective economic development strategy, and that. Sustainable urbanism, sustainable community design, sustainable mobility isn't necessarily something that's going to, in the long term, drag down your economy. It really is a way to make your city region hopefully more globally competitive. So I will close with that. So thank you for your time. <laughs>